All right, so today's goal is to derive Fick's first law and apply it to a simple example of one-dimensional transport phenomena. Okay, so imagine that there's a gate and there's a road and you're sitting on top of the gate. So as you're sitting on top of the gate, what you see is that there are some particles showing up on the left hand side. You could kind of imagine that these are just cars. And there are also some particles showing up on the right hand side. You could also imagine that these are cars as well. What you're interested in doing is figuring out how many particle, particles or, or cars are going to the right per unit time. So the statement of the problem is as such. Again, you're on top of the gate and you are interested in counting the number of particles that pass through the gate. These particles, these red and green particles or cars, can only move along the road. They can only move um, left and right, so they're, they're one-dimensional essentially. And each of these particles has a chance of moving to the left or to the right, and they don't discriminate between those two directions. So it's a 50% chance of moving left or a 50% chance of moving right. So. Let's start modeling the problem, because that's what you're going to be doing in most of transport phenomena. You're going to be modeling problems such as this. So let's introduce P as the number of particles that we have. And let's also introduce um, a little bit of notation as to which side of the gate we mean. So this side of the gate on the left-hand side we'll call Z. And over here on the right-hand side we'll call this Z plus delta z. So everything on the left hand side will be z and everything on the right hand side will be delta z. So if we're talking about counting the particles that pass through the gate, half of the particles that are on the left hand side of the gate will pass through the gate. Remember so of these six, uh, since they have 50% chance of moving left or 50% chance of moving right, three of these particles will move left and three of them will move right, which means three of them are going to traverse through the gate. Similarly, on the right hand side, again half the particles are going to be moving to the right, then half the particles are going to be moving to the left. So the particles on the right that move through the gate are going to be moving to the left. So half of these guys, so two will move the left to the gate and two will move right away from the gate. Okay. So if we're thinking about it as, as in terms of cars, if six cars, uh, three of these go right and two of these go left, then we have a net movement of one car through the gate to the right. So if we want to express this, we simply say it's going to be the difference. So this is the net number of par car cars or particles that are moving to the right. Again, this is going to be half of six minus half of four. Okay. Now, suppose we want to measure that in the span of a time. So say the scenario is only true for, for half an hour, where we have six cars over here and four cars over here. As time goes on, maybe the distributions of cars that are on the left and the cars on the right are different. But in a short amount of time that we're gonna call tau, uh, this is what we see. We see three going to the right and two going to the left. And so we're saying, okay, this is the amount of particles that move through the gate to the right in a certain time frame. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to divide this by the area of the gate. So here is the gate and it has area equal to A. And we're saying that we're going to call that the flux of particles to the right. Okay, so the idea of a flux is you have some sort of material per time per area. Uh, we'll talk more about that later on, but for now just know that the purpose of introducing this flux variable, um, there's, there's a good point in doing that. Okay, now things are going to get a little trickier. So particles aren't something that we usually want to work with. We usually want to work with particles per volume. So we're going to introduce concentration as the particles per volume. And this down here, um, we're expressing volume as the area of the gate times the thickness. So over here, this is Z, this is Z plus delta Z. If we make these two markers here, this being Z and this being delta Z, then the volume that we're interested in encompasses the area of the gate times 
the distance between these two points. So delta Z times A. We're looking at the concentration of particles that are going to be in that region. We arranged, we could express P as C times A times delta Z. That's really just saying if you have the concentration and you multiply it by the volume, you're simply going to get the number of particles that you have. Okay, let's make that substitution. So over here, in this line here, I have the wrong tool selected, we are going to make this substitution. So the first thing that happened was in this term and in this term, I substituted C A delta Z. Uh, since they have A delta Z in common, I pulled those two out. And since there's an A on the bottom and an A on the top, we could cancel out those areas. Okay. Then what we're going to do is something that will seem completely arbitrary right now. It is a trick. So we're going to say delta Z is delta Z squared over delta Z. Uh, it won't be immediately clear why we do this, but as we go through the derivation, you'll see why this bit of trickery is useful. So we're going to be targeting this delta Z right here. And we're going to say that this delta Z is really delta Z squared divided by delta Z. What that allows us to do is it allows us to express this equation like this. So this delta Z was again put into delta Z squared over delta Z. The delta Z in the bottom was put in this term over here, and the delta Z squared was put into this term over here. So this over here, this CZ minus CZ plus delta Z over delta Z should be ringing some sort of bell in your subconscious. You should have seen something like this uh, once or twice in your past, probably more. Um, usually when you see something of this form, it is the derivative definition. Well, it's close to the der derivative definition. We're missing the limit, and we're also uh, flipped as far as the, the numerator goes. So we do want to be taking a derivative soon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip these terms in the numerator, which takes a negative sign out here. So now there's a negative here, and now this is put in here to match the derivative definition. The last thing we need to do is also a little bit of trickery. So we're going to disguise the z dependence of this term here, and we're just going to introduce a constant. And we're going to call this constant d for diffusivity. And it has to be a constant, otherwise the mathematics won't work out when we make the model. So because, of course, when we take the limit, we're going to take the derivative. Um, if this d still had a z dependence, then we have a complicated uh, relationship here where we could have this entire thing going to zero. But we don't see that true in reality, so instead we're going to lump this together as a constant and sort of forget the z dependence momentarily and say we're simply going to take the limit of what's happening here. And as we take the limit, we can now use the derivative definition and we'll arrive at our final expression for what is called fixed first law, which is one of the most important relationships in transfer phenomena. So the assumptions we used to reach this conclusion was that we are doing a one-dimensional random walk. What that means is that that's how we modeled the situation up here. These particles here um, on the left and right hand sides of the gates, so they could only travel in one direction, that is along this road here, a 1D axis. Since it's a random walk, they could both move left or right arbitrarily with a 50% chance. So that's the random walk element and the one-dimensional elements that they can only go along the road. Um, if you want to use more complicated mathematics, um, what you can prove is that for generalized coordinates, you're simply going to be taking the gradient of C, where C is a scalar field. Okay, So this is what we're going to be using later on, but this is all you need to pay attention to right now. If you want to get familiar with fixed first law, you should be looking at this sort of relationship here, where it's just simply one-dimensional. Okay, so let's try to apply that relationship to a problem in transfer phenomena to sort of get you inclined to using fixed first law. So the scenario where it's most often used is a thin film sort of transport. So this is the problem that we are going to be interested in looking at. So let me just get rid of this for a second so we can concentrate on this. Uh, we have a region of a high concentration over here on the left. 
and we have a region of low concentration on the right. This red line represents the concentration per distance. So we have high concentration, the red line is high, and over here we have low concentration, the red line is well, relatively lower. And in this middle region here we have some sort of semi-permeable membrane that we are going to call a thin film. And diffusion is happening through the membrane from the high concentration area to the low concentration area. At the initial part of this membrane we're going to call this Z equals zero and at the end we're going to call this z equals l for the length of the thin film. So we don't know what the transport is going to look like inside this thin film. We don't know if maybe this is the concentration profile in the middle, maybe this is the concentration profile in the middle, maybe it's something even stranger, maybe it looks like this in the middle, but we want to figure out how we can model the concentration as a dependence of distance within this thin film. And the, the first tool we have to do that is what we just derived, and that is Fick's first law. So again, the problem statement is, what does the concentration profile or the concentration as a function of distance look like inside this thin film? And what do we do at Fick's first law? Well, it is an ordinary differential equation that relates concentration and distance. So that's exactly what we want. We have concentration here somewhere, and we also have distance. So we need to solve Fick's first law. Uh, the other problem is that we have this J variable over here, which we're calling the flux. So the flux or the mass transport of material uh, can often depend upon the distance as well. So this is a simple ODE to solve if J has no Z dependence, but if J depends on Z, then we can't simply just separate and integrate as easily. So we first need to investigate whether or not the flux J is a function of distance. All right, so how do we do that? Well, let me show you. So the first thing is that a material balance can be used to find the flux as a function of distance. What does material balance look like? Well, in words, it looks like this. You have some sort of volume, and you're saying whatever goes into the volume minus whatever comes out of the volume plus whatever is generated minus whatever is consumed is equal to the accumulation that is within that control volume. So this, these two terms over here sort of relate to the flow in and out of the system. These two terms here, the generation consumption, relate to the reaction that might be happening within the system. And over here, this accumulation relates to whether or not uh, the, there is a steady state phenomena going on within the, the unit volume or if there's not. For now, let's make it pretty easy on ourselves and assume that first of all there's no reaction, so we're not going to worry about the generation or consumption, we're going to treat those as zero, and often in chemical engineering when we're starting out, we're going to assume that everything is steady state, so we don't have to worry about the accumulation term either. So the only thing we have to worry about is the flow into the system and the flow being out of the system, which we're just going to say is in minus out equals zero for now. Okay, at this point in time, let's reintroduce these variables that we care about. The first one I'm going to call F, and that is the molar flow rate. So it's the moles going into the system per unit time. The molar flux is simply the moles per area time going into the system. So if you have a water faucet, and you can sort of see the sink, um, the water that's flowing into the sink is sort of your flux. It is the water that is going in for that cross-sectional area into the sink. Your molar flow rate is simply the moles of water that are going in per unit time. Okay, so generally when we write a conservation law, we write that conservation law in terms of moles or moles per time. So in the thin film example, we want to do exactly what we did in the fixed first law derivation and say that, okay, we have some sort of flow at Z and so some sort of flow at Z plus delta Z. So within this thin film, we're going to call this part z, and we're going to call this part delta z. Well, be more specific, z plus delta z. So we're interested in looking at a small slice of this inner area of the film that looks like this. Eventually we're going to use boundary conditions to expand this out to the left and right hand bounds, but for now let's just consider an arbitrary unit inside. 
Okay, so there's going to be some sort, of, some sort of molar flow at this part and some sort of molar flow at this part. That's what's represented here. Okay, and we're going to use the exact same trick as last time. And we are going to, since we don't have to worry about anything over here, we can simply divide by delta z, which we know is not going to be zero. And we're going to put this in form for the limit definition. The other thing that we want to do is we want to express this in terms of flux because we're interested in getting j as a function of z. So since we also have the 0 over here, we could divide by a and not change anything. So what we now get is that the only difference between the molar flow and the molar flux is that a. So we could absorb the a into these two terms and call these fluxes. Now that we have that, we could simply take the limit as delta z goes to 0. And what we see is that this is really saying the derivative of the flux in terms of dz goes to 0, which you know from your ODE's course implies that j must be constant or that j is not a function of z, right? So if the derivative of this goes to 0, that's only true if j is a constant. If j is 5 and you take the derivative of 5, you're going to get 0. So that's exactly what this is saying here. So now we know the dependence of our flux on dz is going to be that it's not dependent, it's, it's constant, so it doesn't matter. Okay, once we've discovered that, what happens next? Well, that's exactly what we're looking for. We have fixed first law. Fixed first law relates the concentration to distance, and then we have the j as a function of z, or not as a function of z. So now we can finally solve this ordinary differential equation as well. All right, let's do that. So again, this is fixed first law. And from what we just found out before, we know that the j is a constant. So what we're going to introduce is this new constant, k sub 0, that represents our flux. OK? We're going to find some sort of algebraic expression or numerical value for that later on. But for now, let's just say it's a constant. Let's not worry about it too much. So we separate variables like this and we integrate and what we get is that our concentration profile or our concentration as a function of distance looks like this where we now have two constants All right because we just integrated dz that's going to get a z we integrated dc that's just going to get a c we also have to add a new constant of integration onto our equation okay so let's talk boundary conditions Looking up here, we have this concentration at z0, or z equals 0, and we have this concentration at, well, cl, or c, where z equals l. So we're going to introduce those two as our boundary conditions. Initially, the concentration is c0, and at the end of the thin film, it is c sub l. Okay. Well, that makes it pretty easy to solve. We put in this first boundary condition. What we find out is that k1 is simply going to be equal to c0. And then we could put in the second boundary condition, knowing that to be true. We have to worry about this k0. So putting in our second boundary condition, this is what we get. Solving for k0 we get this. And then subbing that back into the concentration profile that we had, we get this. So this is our concentration profile solution for the thin film infusion problem. So we have this initial concentration, right? And then what's going on here? Well, we have Cl minus C0. Over here, since C0 is high concentration and Cl is low concentration, what you can see is that Remember, this is high concentration, this is low concentration, so this term will be negative. So as we go through the thin film, as z increases from 0 to l, uh, we're losing some of c0. c0 is going to be subtracted from this term. It's going to be c0 minus something over here. So we also know it's going to be linear. So it's going to start here, and it's going to literally decrease until there. That means is that our concentration profile 
is going to look something like this. It's going to literally decrease from here to here. And that's simply what we get from our model. Okay, so what else might be we be interested in, in solving for? Well, we're also sort of interested about what the flux is. Remember the flux is J. We found out that J is a constant, but that doesn't mean that J doesn't have a value that we're interested in. So what is J? Well, what you're always going to do is you're going to, again, take fixed first law, but now we have a concentration uh, versus Z function. So we're going to take the derivative of the concentration profile we just got above here. So if you take the, D, the Z derivative, this will cancel out, and we're simply gonna get CL minus C naught over L. And plugging that in here, we're gonna have negative D times CL minus C naught over L. So this is a constant. And remember, this term is negative over here. Remember, because CL is smaller than C0, or C0 is greater than CL, so this entire thing will be negative, canceling out this negative, and your flux is going to be positive. What that means is that when we model the overall problem, you'll see this. A linearly decreasing concentration profile, and your flux is going to be constant and positive this way, in the direction from the high concentration to the low concentration. So the outcomes from our modeling of the thin film diffusion is that our flux is constant, our concentration profile is linear and decreasing, it looks like this, and our flux, while constant, can be expressed as this.